All right, thank you. I'm Tremel Hudson, and I really like to take things apart. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about Thunderstrike, which is a EFI firmware uh, rootkit for Apple MacBooks. And the, the talk is going to have a few parts. The first half is going to be about the sort of ex the journey of reverse engineering the EFI boot ROM uh, in the MacBook. The second half is going to be about developing the Thunderstrike vulnerability. And then the third half is going to be about mitigation strategies. What can we do to prevent it that hopefully are better than epoxying the ports shut? So reverse engineering is a hobby of mine. Uh, one of my more famous projects is the Magic Lantern firmware for the Canon cameras. It's a GPL runtime that lets you write your own uh, software. I also... <laughs> thank you. I also really enjoy retro computing and uh, digging through old computers and in the ROMs to see what sort of Easter eggs there are, such as uh, this Mac SE that contains a, uh, four photos of the team that worked on it uh, back in the, the mid-80s. And I'd really like to thank my firm, Two Sigma Investments. It's, it's a high-tech hedge fund in New York City uh, that has encouraged me to do this research and to publish it. I'd especially like to thank uh, my colleagues Thor Simon, uh, Victor Duchovny, and Larry Rudolph for their assistance in preparing this for publication. You might ask, why is a hedge fund interested in this sort of uh, vulnerability? And it really comes down to security, that we care about the security of, of our data and of our systems. And we'd heard about some, uh, some attacks on MacBooks, and we were thinking about deploying them. So I was asked to use my reverse engineering skills to look into uh, some of these attacks. So I started by going through and reading and uh, watching conference uh, presentations. And there's an enormous amount of uh, marvelous presentations, in fact, a lot by people who are even here today um, that, that helped teach me about how systems boot and how uh, to protect the boot process. Although most of them are looking at the, uh, the Intel uh, and Windows side of things, the secure boot path, and comparatively few are looking at uh, Apple's uh, boot time security, or things like uh, Thunderbolt security. The uh, Snares Black Hat presentation in 2012 was the one that actually started me on this project. So with most reverse engineering projects, the first thing that you need to do is get into the system to get a feel for what, what's there. Apple uses these pentalobe screws to uh, make it a little bit more difficult to get in. Um, I did it the old-fashioned way and made a bit of a mess, um, but you can also buy screwdrivers for a few dollars, or a few euros. <laughs> so once you get inside, Apple has done a beautiful job on the aesthetics of this machine, despite the fact that they make it so hard to get into. They've, uh, they've really paid a lot of attention to the aesthetics and the layout. Usually what happens with malware is it comes in over the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet, gets a buffer overflow into, into RAM, gets some code running on the CPU that eventually writes something to the, uh, to the hard drive. What this talk about, though, is the boot ROM, uh, which is this chip over here. If we zoom into it, we can read out the part number, the 25L6406. And we can look up the data sheet. Uh, it's a 64 megabit, 8 megabyte uh, serial flash. And we call it a boot ROM, but it's really an EE prom uh, with flash memory in it. SPI means that it has uh, data in, data out, and uh, external clock that's uh, controlled by um, external hardware. You, what a lot of other researchers have done is use the, uh, the Bus Pirate, which is a uh, off-the-shelf logic analyzer uh, tool, and uh, comes with these test clips, so you can easily hook it up. The problem is the, bu the Bus Pirate's kind of slow. It takes a couple hours to, to read and write the ROM, and it's very fiddly. Since I do a lot of work with ROMs, I've actually built a uh, a SPI flash reader uh, based on a Teensy, which is kind of like an Arduino. Um, the sources are uh, GPL, and you can download them and, and have at it. This one can read the ROM in a few seconds and write it in about a minute. One uh, word of caution, if you're doing reverse engineering of this, disconnect the battery before you hook up the external programmer. Uh, otherwise, there, you'll have conflicting voltages on the rails, and uh, as the voice of experience, that's not a good thing. So, two years ago when Snare was doing his work, 
uh, he found that if he changed the ROM at all, um, the machine wouldn't boot. And he conjectured that there's something checking a signature on the boot ROM. Um, and that made me very curious. You know, what, what is doing that check? Um, so I repeated his, his work, and I made a one-byte change to somewhere in the ROM, and the result is pretty much a, a bricked machine, that there's no, no lights, no sounds, um, no sign of any life at all from the outside. But since we have the bottom off, we can flip it over and we can look at the inside. And when we power it up, th uh, the fans spin up, the uh, CPU cooling fans. And then a few seconds later, they spin down. And that indicates that something is checking the ROM. Uh, it could be an external piece of hardware, which is a lot of folks have conjectured, or it might just be something in the boot ROM itself, um, which, of course, leads us to question, what, what is doing that? Um, if it is only software, we could perhaps uh, uh, bypass that check, um, and the easiest way to figure that out would be to change the first instruction that gets run. And to find out what that is, we go back to the, uh, the late 70s, early 80s, um, for the 8080, because when your modern x86-64 starts up, it boots in real mode and reads the first instruction from what at the time was the top of physical memory at one megabyte, and then does a jump uh, somewhere elsewhere in memory to finish the initialization. Using the bus pirate or the flash ROM tool or my SPI flash reader, we can disassemble that part of the ROM. And we find that, indeed, it starts with a cache invalidate that's actually new, uh, but then it does a jump uh, lower in memory to finish the initialization. What if we change the address that that jumps to? So rather than jumping uh, off to there, it just creates an infinite loop. And uh, it will just spin there. When we flash, uh, using the in-system programmer, when we flash this into the ROM, there are uh, two possibilities that could happen. The fans might spin up and then spin down again, which would mean that there is something outside that's actually checking that ROM. Uh, or the fans might just keep spinning continuously, which would indicate that, uh, that it's only a software check. Um, I'm up here today, so there's probably not too much of a surprise as to what happens, but yes, the, the fans stay on. So this gives us one bit of output before the rest of the system has started, that we now know uh, a way to signal what's going on. And this infinite loop is a very common uh, reverse engineering technique. Uh, you can drop it somewhere in the code, and if the system hangs, that means that your code is running. But this also means that uh, there is no external hardware. Um, Apple used to have a TPM on their motherboards, but they, uh, they actually removed it um, because they weren't using it at the time. So as a quick recap, we, now, we can now uh, reprogram uh, the ROM with the in-system programming hardware, and we know that there's no external hardware that's actually checking the ROM validity. But something is checking the validity, um, and we need to find that piece of code. So to figure out how the ROM is organized, we can go to Intel's EFI specification uh, for their firmware volume. And uh, it has this field labeled signature, which sounds perhaps likely, except it's literally just the four characters, underscore FVH. Uh, there's this checksum, but it only covers the header. And uh, the other interesting thing in this, in this uh, section is the zero vector, which isn't really defined uh, what it's used for. So we'll, we'll come back to that. If we do a hex dump, and there will be some hex dumps uh, in this presentation, um, if we do a hex dump of the, uh, the top segment of the ROM, basically the last 64 kilobytes, we, we can spot that underscore FVH signature pretty easily. And there's the 16-bit checksum here covering these uh, hex 48 bytes of header. Um, and the zero vector, we can see, is not zero. It contains something. Those first eight bytes were always the same in every firmware volume in, in the ROM. But these last eight bytes varied between uh, each of the firmware volumes. Um, and uh, so that, that's interesting. Um, the, uh, uh, to try to figure out where things are in the ROM, we can use a tool like strings. 
And what's interesting is this ROM image actually doesn't have very many strings, but we can find things like uh, that FVH signature. And then a few bytes later, this really tantalizing string that says ROM integrity. So let's fire up our interactive disassembler. Uh, I'm using Hopper in, in this case uh, on that section of the ROM. And apologize, it's a little small. Uh, the slides will be available if you actually want to dig through it later. Uh, we, we can see that it does a comparison uh, of that signature, the FVH. And then there's this chunk of code here that uh, computes some stuff with the length, and then it does something with the offset eight into the zero vector uh, at the start of that firmware volume. Um, one thing Hopper can do is give us pseudocode that we can then massage into something that looks kind of like C. And what we can see is that uh, it's calling a function uh, on the data part of the, uh, the firmware volume, storing the result in that, in that uh, address, and then it compares it uh, to that part of the zero vector. So this, this function is clearly involved in somehow in, in checking on, um, on that validity. Using Hopper, we can interactively step into, the, uh, into that function, and we find that it does a bunch of stuff in a loop, reading over the, uh, the, the bytes of data, but it also accesses this table 32 bits at a time. Uh, as uh, Rudolph suggested uh, two days ago, when you run into these um, random hex values, toss them into a search engine, and you, know, you never know what you're going to find. In this case, uh, there, there's that constant, and there's the next five constants. So now, a lot of our reverse engineering is done. We now can probably guess this function is CRC32. And in, in fact, we can now uh, make a one-byte change to the firmware, manually compute that CRC32, reflash it with the in-system programmer, and it now works. So we have a new bullet point that uh, there's only a boot time CRC32 check of, of the ROM. This is not a cryptographic check. This is only to ensure that the ROM has not accidentally been corrupted or that uh, somehow it has been um, misprogrammed. So simply by regenerating that CRC, you can, you can uh, change the ROM. You might ask, why isn't there a cryptographic check? Um, other researchers have, have looked into this and uh, come to the conclusion that the flash uh, ROMs are only checked when they're being updated. Uh, and once it's written, it's never checked again. One possible reason for that is uh, for speed, to have a faster boot time. But doing the CRC requires reading through the whole ROM anyway, so it's not like you're going to save that much time. The, the, the real reason is that malicious software can just skip the checks. That if you can write to the ROM, you can just ch change that, uh, whatever the function is, and to always return true, or it can return a pre-computed hash value. So without any sort of cryptographic hardware to help out, a software-only attempt uh, is doomed to failure. Earlier, I, I mentioned that there weren't a lot of strings in, in the ROM image. Um, in all eight megabytes, uh, very little of it had any actual human readable strings. Um, most of that was up here in the early boot code, and there, there are two copies. I don't fully understand why. Um, this is a graph of the entropy of the ROM uh, generated with a bin walk, which is a really great uh, free software tool. Um, the zero entropy regions are free space, they're all Fs. And the rest of the ROM is very high entropy, which could be encrypted or compressed. So when we, uh, to figure out what part of the ROM to look at, we can decode the flash descriptor region of the ROM. And flash ROM will, tells us that the BIOS is um, the, the latter part of it from 190000 up to, and, until the end. So let's, uh, let's look at what's stored at the start of that BIOS region. And again, we can go back to our hex dump. Uh, and it, it looks like a firmware, um, a firmware image, excuse me, a firmware image file section. So we've got three bytes for the length, about 15K for this section. The next byte is the section type, and type one is a compressed section, which matches well with, with what we thought. 
so we then turn to the compression section documentation. And we see the next four bytes are going to be the uncompressed length, about 36K, so they've got a little better than two, uh, two to one. The next byte then is the compression type, and they've got type two, which is not defined in, in the specification. So that's a bit of a problem. What I did notice, though, is that these next four bytes uh, in all of the firmware sections were the same. What do we do when we see something like that? Toss into the search engine, and we get a perfect hit for uh, LZMA uh, at compression level negative no seven. So to verify this, we, we can use a tool like DD to extract uh, the compressed bytes, um, skipping that nine byte section header, filtering it through uh, LZCAT, which will uh, decompress it if it's a valid LZMA format, and no complaints from, uh, from LZCAT, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, the file sizes match up with what we saw in the header. And there are now human readable strings. These are just absolute golden uh, if you're doing reverse engineering, especially printf strings, those uh, percent %0d and percent %0s and whatnot. Those are what tell you how things are happening inside the code. So. Once you have that sort of thing, it's very, very easy to start figuring out what else is going on. So we now know uh, how the firmware volumes are compressed. It's type two. Uh, we can flash new code with the in-system programmer after recompression. Um, I'm not the first person to figure this out. I'm, I'm quite certainly not the first person, but I've never seen anyone else write it down. So I wanted to make sure that, that this is now out there where other people can, uh, can start working with these firmware volumes. Thank you. So why can't we write to the boot ROM, the boot ROM flash from software? You know, we, why do we still have to use this hardware uh, programmer? And it turns out that the flash is not directly connected to the CPU. That it, the flash over here is actually connected to the platform controller hub, and access to it is mediated by things like the management engine. When the system boots, the, uh, the UEFI uh, forum recommends that all of these uh, regions be locked as quickly as possible. This is done via registers like uh, uh, Flockdown that uh, control access to the configuration, the read-write access, and they can only be cleared during a hardware reset. So this means that uh, once the system is booted, you can't write to uh, to those parts of the ROM. Um, but we know that Apple updates the firmware, that they uh, pretty regularly ship uh, EFI and SMC firmware updates that, that write new code into this ROM. And it has a really nice GUI that will make sure it's the right version for your system and whatnot. But under the covers, it's using a tool, a command line tool called Bless that uh, takes the SCAP file that is stored in the image that you download and copies it to the EFI system partition, um, and then sets a in, uh, EFI NVRAM variable, so that the next time the system boots, it sees that variable, and it does what's called a recovery mode boot. So the SCAP file is another undocumented uh, uh, blob that we need to figure out what's actually in it. What are they, what are they doing in there? Um, so hex dumps are, I spend too much of my life staring at hex dumps, and you know, it's kind of a, a good way to, to get accustomed to what's going on in the machine. We can easily spot the file uh, volume signature there, uh, but it's not at the start of the file. It's actually offset by about 50 bytes, and we see that there's a 50 byte value amongst all those zeros. Uh, based on the firmware volume specification, we know that that's the size of the volume, and we see there's a similar value um, elsewhere in, in the header, which actually matches uh, the size of the total file. One thing that you encounter a lot if you do uh, EFI firmware reverse engineering is that there are these 16-byte uh, GUIDs, which they can be frustrating, but they're also marvelous uh, uh, search engine uh, targets. So when we toss that in, into whatever search engine, we get a perfect hit on uh, yet another uh, EFI specification document. And as expected, here's the header size, uh, here's the image size, um, and the rest of the fields are all zero. 
But one thing that, that we noticed there is that the, uh, there's an extra 220 hex bytes at the end of the file. Um, so let's look at that. Uh, again, hex dump in it. Um, and it's all high entropy. There's nothing, there's nothing human readable. It's just random values. Well, on the off chance that this might be another GUID, what do we do? We search for it. We get one hit, and uh, it's a mailing list post from just a couple months ago. Um, uh, I wish I had actually found this much, much longer ago. Um, and it's describing a RSA 2048 uh, SHA-256 uh, signing and gives us a structure that's uh, uh, 210 hex bytes. So this matches very closely to the trailer that we're seeing. So this is a pretty good idea of what's going on there. So um, my next step would be, let's, uh, let's try to check that. And this is a Perl program. Uh, I realize Perl may be worse than assembly for some people, but um, it's handy. Uh, so it reads in the, uh, the SCAP file and extracts out the firmware volume and then the RSA public key and the signature based on that, that structure that we found in that mailing list post. Uh, it then uses the default RSA exponent since there's not one stored in there. And I really need to give huge thanks to my colleague, uh, Victor Duchovny, who suggested uh, swapping the byte order to put it into a, a big Indian. Um, and once we've done that, we build the RSA key, we verify uh, the signature, and it's OK. So we now know how Apple is signing their, their firmware updates, um, which Not only do we know how they're being signed, but we know that the BLESS tool doesn't check the, the signature, that something in uh, the boot process that does it. Um, and as a word of warning, if you BLESS an invalid file, uh, BLESS will happily copy to the partition, set the variable, and you will brick your machine. You will have to do a full in-system uh, programming uh, reflash of the ROM to, to clear that. So, but, you know, where are those signatures being checked? We, we know somewhere in that update process. Um, but it could be hardware, again. Uh, the management engine or the SMC perhaps could be helping out. Um, or it might just be software. So if we do a binary grep for those, uh, those GUIDs that we just found, uh, we find one file in the uncompressed ROM that matches. And it actually matches uh, all three of them. Um, so if we look at the bit of code that, uh, that works with them, we find that it does the, uh, the GUID compares, um, as we'd expect. It checks the file size along with that uh, hex 220 byte trailer. Um, and it also then references uh, this GUID, which is the DXE services table, um, which becomes very interesting. If we uh, step a little bit further in the code to what refers to the DXE table, we find that it passes the firmware volume, um, the contents of the firmware volume, uh, through a function pointer at offset hex 98 in the DXE services table. To find out where that is, we go back to the specification. And they don't give us offsets, but we can count eight bytes at a time, because we're in, we're in long mode here. And we find that that is calling process firmware volume. That takes the RAM copy of the, uh, the firmware volume and essentially mounts it and makes it available to other uh, functions in, in the uh, firmware. If that succeeds, it then calls another function at offset uh, hex 80. And this is dispatch, which will execute any code that was in the firmware volume that was just mounted. So assembly is a little messy. Let's translate that to some pseudocode. Uh, we see it does the, uh, the, the GUID check. Um, it does the RSA uh, check on the SHA-256. It then calls process firmware volume and uh, dispatch. Um, uh, and uh, that then jumps into the flasher that's in the, uh, in the SCAP file. So we can now, because of what we've learned already, we know how to make modifications to the ROM. Uh, to find out, you know, to try things out. So one question that I had is, is this, uh, this, this RSA check the only place that it's done? 
or is something in the management engine or some other hardware also doing it? So I can just comment it out. I can just you know, uh, put jumps around that so it doesn't get executed. And then I can uh, generate a, a bogus SCAP file. Uh, here's the trailer on it with the, uh, the usual GUIDs and whatnot. But uh, that is pretty clearly not a valid RSA signature uh, in the file. Um, so if I bless this SCAP and the machine bricks, that means that some piece of hardware is also checking it. But if the, uh, the system accepts this SCAP file and updates the firmware with its contents, then that means that it's just software. Once again, I'm up here giving this presentation, so you can probably guess what happens. The firmware gets updated, um, which, again, is pretty fascinating. This means that uh, there is, the firmware signatures are only being verified by software. There is no hardware uh, involved. So, next question is, can we, uh, uh, could we do this sort of change without internal access to the system? Right now, to make these changes, we have to open the machine and the, to the ROM. Um, and based on the work that Snare did with the Thunderbolt port, I thought we might be able to. So Thunderbolt brings the internal PCIe bus to the outside world. And when the system starts up, it, uh, it enumerates all the devices on the bus, and it asks if they have any option ROMs that uh, should be executed. Option ROMs are a legacy feature that literally goes back to the very first uh, IBM PC uh, with that Intel 8080. The BIOS was typically a mask or a UV ROM, and there were these six sockets where uh, you could put in optional ROMs that would have things like basic and device drivers for, for other things. And the ISA expansion bus cards could also carry their own ROMs that would then uh, become available uh, for the BIOS. So that's, we're talking about a legacy feature, uh, going back 35 years here. Um, Using it as an attack vector is not a particularly new idea. Uh, John Heisman at Black Hat in 2007 uh, showed how to put an attack vector onto an expansion card. And uh, Snare's work on the, uh, was pretty damn awesome. He built a gigabit uh, Ethernet Thunderbolt adapter that could, um, uh, could backdoor the OS X kernel. Um, and that was done in 2012. That flaw is actually still in uh, MacBooks. Um, so you know, if you uh, uh, put one of these Thunderbolt adapters with, a, um, with the Option ROM exploit on it and boot the system, uh, this is one that I built that uh, will capture your uh, file vault password. Um, I have since changed it to a password one, which is much more secure. Um, So the problem is that option ROMs can't write to the uh, flash because they are loaded in the DXE phase of the boot, but the flash is locked uh, during the PEI phase. Um, however, except during boot ROM firmware updates, in which case the flash is not locked, and we saw that the, uh, the flasher, uh, the, the, the uh, flasher code was running in 64-bit mode, which means the firmware update program is also running in the DXE phase, uh, along with the option ROMs. Which leads me to question, are option ROMs also loaded during those firmware updates? And the way that I wanted to figure that out, I could go through and do a bunch of reverse engineering and walking through code and stuff, but that, that's too much work. So I go back to the infinite loop trick, and I built an option ROM that just does an infinite loop. Um, that uh, uh, the EFI firmware is single-threaded, so this will basically lock up the machine. So now if I uh, connect the Thunderbolt device with that infinite loop option ROM and uh, power on the machine after blessing an SCAP file, if it goes into the firmware update, that means that the option ROMs are not loaded uh, during a recovery mode boot. But if the fans just spin and the machine appears to be bricked, then that means that uh, the option ROMs are being loaded and executed. So, do you guys know what the answer is? Yes, option ROMs are loaded during the recovery mode boot. Uh, <laughs> 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 
However, there is a minor roadblock that there is a uh, PEI 32-bit uh, mode signature check of the SCAP file before the option ROM gets executed. So is there a way that we could bypass that check? If we go back to uh, that pseudocode for the, uh, the flasher um, verification, remember that uh, process firmware volume is being called uh, via a function pointer that's in RAM, not in ROM. So the option ROM could replace that, uh, that function pointer uh, in a process called hooking. So we can modify the option ROM to now uh, to hook the process firmware volume uh, function pointer and replace it with its own. And it also then stores the old one so that it can reuse it later. If you have a sufficiently large option ROM, you just put your whole firmware uh, exploit in there and, uh, and it, uh, it's game over. However, the one that, that uh, we're using, the uh, Gigabit Ethernet adapter, only has about uh, 32K of space available. So we can't put a full 8 meg ROM image in there. But what we came up with is actually even more interesting, that we can uh, instead put in an RSA public key that we control, and the process firmware volume function will search through the firmware volume looking for Apple's public key. If it finds it, it mem copies it, uh, our public key over it, then fixes up the CRC32, since we now know how to do that, and then it calls the old process firmware volume on this now modified uh, image. And uh, when we, uh, so when we now uh, boot the machine with, um, again, with the Thunderbolt device, with what we're called the Thunderstrike exploit, because all cool exploits have, uh, have names these days. Uh, so when we boot up the machine, um, the, uh, here's the exploit code running uh, in the recovery mode boot, and we're not worried about stealthiness in this proof of concept. And now here is Apple's own firmware update routine flashing uh, our option ROM with, excuse me, our RSA key into the boot ROM on the motherboard. And once that's done, uh, we now own the system and we can flash whatever we want using Apple's own update tools. So. So, and all exploits also get logos, and I think theme songs and websites now. Um, so, we now know how to uh, circumvent flash security with the option ROMs, and because we've replaced the key, this boot kit can't be re removed uh, without, uh, through software alone, because we control the key that the firmware is going to use, that uh, uh, there's no uh, official channel that, that can remove it. So, how would something like Thunderstrike, if, if it were to be weaponized, uh, actually be deployed? You know, one option is uh, something like what the NSA is doing, where they intercept shipments of hardware and make modifications, uh, as they're seen here doing to uh, Cisco routers. The other one is the evil maid attack that folks hypothesize, in which you're at a conference, say in Hamburg, and you go down to the hotel uh, to get some breakfast and room service comes in and they, they make the bed and backdoor your laptop and uh, leave some fresh towels. Uh, or when you're uh, flying uh, through international borders. Um, in fact, uh, the US courts have said that there is no protection uh, for citizens or uh, visitors alike at uh, the US border. In fact, uh, in this um, uh, decision against the uh, a, a U.S. citizen photographer, uh, that they said that the laptops are the most dangerous contraband, and uh, there's, there's no, uh, you know, that you have no expectation of privacy. So, this, uh, this, also, this vulnerability uh, is in pretty much every uh, MacBook since about 2011 when Thunderbolt showed up. Um, I've personally tested about six or seven and, and found it in there. Um, the uh, pre-Thunderbolt devices are not affected. <laughs> so, <laughs> These also have mask ROMs, so writing to that would be a more challenge anyway. <laughs> you, you guys might also have heard of a, another uh, exploit called Stuxnet 
that spread via uh, shared USB um, uh, media and was able to uh, get all the way into the air-gapped uh, SCADA systems of Iran's uh, nuclear refinement uh, system. It turns out that option ROMs on external Thunderbolt devices can be written from that early boot code. So this allows Thunderstrike to actually spread virally from, through shared devices. So you get, uh, you know, you have a, a Thunderbolt Ethernet device that you share between machines at work, and it, you know, is able to, to go across them. So, you know, all Thunderbolt Macs, MacBooks are vulnerable. They can spread virally. Um, what can we do to prevent this? So I've been in, in contact with Apple, and uh, they have a, uh, they, on uh, their new machines, the, the Mac Minis and the iMac Retinas um, that we've tested, they're no longer loading option ROMs during firmware updates. They will be rolling this out for uh, the other Macs. However, they're still loading option ROMs on normal boots. Snare's attack from 2012 still works. He, you can still get backdoored uh, uh, via the, the OS X kernel. Um, it's also possible on the older machines to do a downgrade attack, that you can downgrade to an older, vulnerable version of the firmware and then attack it that way. And Thunderstrike V2 could use a, a, the Dark Jedi uh, sleep attack, which you may have heard of. Um, it was introduced yesterday uh, here at uh, 31C3 um, by uh, uh, Raphael and Corey. And what they found is that uh, during a, a S3 sleep, uh, all of the uh, lock bits are cleared, including uh, flock down and the BIOS control. The Thunderbolt option ROM is in a prime position to be able to do this sort of attack. It, it doesn't need to do any privileged execution. It's already running in ring zero. So uh, there was not enough Club Mate for me to actually implement this last night, but you know, look for it in an uh, upcoming paper, perhaps. So Apple could add TPM hardware back to their Macs. Uh, it wouldn't prevent the Dark Jedi uh, attack, but it would at least let you detect it on the next boot. Um, they could also implement driver signing. Uh, the uh, future EFI protocols have it as almost mandatory, but the version they have uh, has this rather ill-defined uh, security architecture-specific security protocol. And they do implement that, um, but this is the entirety of the uh, the implementation. And it turns out that actually Proto can never be null, so it just unconditionally approves every option ROM that it encounters, which uh, does not provide any security at all. So because uh, I don't think option ROMs are a great idea, and uh, you know, none of my devices need it, um, I've modified all of my MacBooks to, uh, to bypass this call to process option ROM. Um, and Thunderstrike actually does this on uh, the systems that it infects, so you can't actually use Thunderstrike to remove Thunderstrike. It's, it's closed the door behind it. <laughs> However, closing down uh, the option ROMs might not even be enough. Um, how many of you plugged into the projector up here? How many of you actually verified what the connector was? that at Black Hat earlier this year, the Alloy Viper was uh, deployed. It's a decoy VGA adapter. It's kind of hard to see there. But it daisy changed to a real VGA adapter, uh, going through a slot screamer, which is doing active DMA attacks against uh, the PCIe bus of the running uh, system. And it can backdoor OS X. Uh, with a little bit more work, it could actually launch a Thunderstrike attack as well. So I believe that we need a way to disable PCIe functions on Thunderbolt entirely. That if you just want to use it for your display, you shouldn't have to expose your system to this sort of attack. Um, I've done a little bit of work trying to do this. This would be a lot easier for Apple to implement as a uh, configuration option. Just like they do right now, that if you set a firmware password, uh, the machine won't boot from external media because that's a security risk. If you have a firmware password, it shouldn't load option ROMs. You should be able to turn off uh, these things. You could also go a little more extreme. Uh, last year at uh, 30C3, Peter Stooges suggested hardwiring uh, write protect pins and desoldering programmable controllers. And he uh, went through a bunch of work on how to harden a, a, a ThinkPad against uh, external attacks. And if you do go that far, uh, you also should 
considered using some sort of tamper evident uh, coverings over the screws to figure out if anyone has opened your machine. This is as suggested by uh, Eric Michaud uh, uh, last year, also at uh, 30C3. So, to sum up, how bad could an actual weaponized version of uh, Thunderstrike be? You know, there's nothing looking for firmware rootkits on OS X right now. Uh, it's in control of the system from the very first instruction. It can backdoor the kernel, it can log keystrokes, it can exfiltrate data. Uh, it can't be removed by software uh, since it controls the RSA keys. It also controls the update routines. You can reinstall OS X and it will still be there. You can swap out your SSD, it will still be there. You can swap out your laptop and your uh, Thunderbolt device might reinfect your new one. So it's very persistent. It can also hide in things like SMM, virtualization, or maybe even the management engine, although that's uh, another area of interesting research. It can spread virally via shared devices, and it affects all current models of uh, Intel MacBooks with Thunderbolt. So that's a pretty bad combination of things if somebody were to actually take this and turn it into uh, more than a proof of concept. But what would really make it worse is I think this is actually remotely installable. Um, combining the, uh, the deep Jedi coma attack with option ROMs embedded in the system, I think this could actually be launched with uh, just merely a, a root exploit on, onto the system. So, on that cherry note, I'll take some uh, questions and also we'll be having a uh, workshop for folks who want to do a little more deep dive into the, uh, into the firmware images in Hall C, um, in a little while after, uh, after the talk. Thank you very much, Tremel. Um, we have some time for questions. First, are there questions from the internet? Yes, thank you. Uh, there's one question from the internet. How many Macs have been destroyed making this presentation? <laughs> I have been uh, quite lucky, uh, both with Magic Lantern and with this project, I have managed to not brick any machines. Okay, uh, you can also line up behind the microphones if you have questions. Um, there was a second question from the internet. No, then microphone number one, please. Thank you, it was a very, very cool presentation. Um, if you have been thunderstruck uh, and you bless an original firmware, uh, will you break the machine? Yes. Is that something that thunderstruck can prevent? Yes. Okay. It's, the proof of concept is very, very simple. That it could actually uh, be much more sophisticated. It could detect that this is a sign, an Apple signed file, and do something different. Um, you know, it has total control of the update process. So it could do. It could even allow the update to go and then patch it after the fact, um, depending on how sophisticated you wanted to be. Or it might just pretend to, to run the update and then, um, right. uh, and then ignore it. Okay, thanks. Microphone number two. Yeah, the way I understand it, uh, you have to request the um, EFI upgrade while that um, Thunderstrike device is attached in order to um, do the exploit, or is it possible to do it just like by attaching it without having an EFI upgrade? So the option ROM can initiate a, an EFI update, that it can, uh, basically anything that the kernel could do, the option ROM could do. But does so, it have to be attached during the boot phase, or can I just attach it while the thing is running, if I want to? Ah, uh, so in this case, with, this, with a passive device like the uh, Gigabit Ethernet adapter, the machine does have to be rebooted. Okay, so um, if I just attach it while it's running to, to a second screen, it should be possible. But I have to re reboot it, basically. Yes, you, you okay. do have to reboot it. So, you know, from the perspective of uh, someone who's been attacked, they come back and they find their machine is rebooted, or their machine is, is shut down, and they would say, curses. Um, you know, it, it, it's pretty rare that Macs crash, but they do crash occasionally, so it's not out of the question, you know, that, that, that would tip them off. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Microphone number four. Hey, so this attack would be mitigated on PCs with Thunderbolt by secure boots requiring option ROM signing, right? A absolutely. So a case where secure boot does actually protect against the vulnerability being demonstrated on stage. Uh, I believe so. Awesome. Thank you. Microphone number five. Hi, thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, here in the back. 
Um, is, uh, can you imagine uh, this is working uh, on other laptops too, since uh, this is a PCI Express uh, option ROM thing? Uh, could this be done on not Apple devices too, in some other fashion? So uh, John Heisman's work was on a, a PC using just a generic PCIe uh, card that had a programmable option ROM. Uh, a lot of SATA controllers have them and are potentially vulnerable. The, uh, the, the ease of uh, sort of evil made attacking uh, a MacBook via Thunderbolt is much, much um, simpler than having to open up a PC and put a card into it. OK, um, microphone number one. So this would also apply to other machines with Thunderbolt. For example, the, the better Lenovo's have uh, Thunderbolt now, and if you switch off the TPM chip, then you're probably vulnerable, or if somebody has a private key and signs the malware with a private key, then you are all vulnerable, I think. It, exactly, and as, um, as Matthew had pointed out, that if you have a secure boot that actually signs the option ROMs, then they would, they would not be vulnerable to this. Um, although a device with Thunderbolt would potentially be uh, subject to the, uh, to the slot screamer attack, which was an active uh, PCIe DMA device. Another question from the internet? Yes, thank you. I've got two um, other questions. Um, the first one is, could you imagine of a pure software solution as well? Uh, and the second one is, um, is there a way to detect that the, um, um, the ROM is tampered with? So to the software question, uh, I could imagine perhaps someone could produce bug-free software and BIOS updates, but the, uh, the number of presentations uh, that find flaws in, in software, um, particularly in, in BIOS updates, makes me think a software-only solution is, is unlikely. And uh, what was the second question again? Um, is there any possibility to detect that the, the ROM is tampered with? So in the proof of concept, it's, it's uh, quite trivial. It actually advertises itself with the, with the logo. Uh, but a weaponized version would be very hard to detect, that if it's hiding in either system management mode, it can detect attempts to write to the, excuse me, to read from the ROM and serve up a clean copy. Or it could uh, boot the system into virtualization and uh, just provide a, a complete virtual ROM that looks uh, intact. Microphone number two. Um, are you missing any features uh, like booting from network if you disable the option ROMs? No. The, uh, it turns out that the modern MacBooks have the driver for the, the gigabit Ethernet adapter bundled into, into their boot ROM already, so the option ROM is completely superfluous. It serves no purpose. Thanks. Number one. Okay, uh, two quick questions. First, if uh, you, you mentioned, I think that you have to bless a firmware update to launch the attack. So if I set a firmware password and shut down my computer before I leave it in my hotel room, can I prevent it? No. The firmware password is actually checked after option ROMs. So uh, there's a another, um, uh, there's a much simpler attack that uh, an option ROM can actually just clear your firmware password. Um, and to the other point of your, part of your question, the option ROM doesn't actually even need to boot OS X. It can, direct, it can just set the NVRAM variable and initiate a recovery, and then initiate a recovery mode reboot uh, from the option ROM, because it's, it's in ring zero. It can do pretty much anything. Okay. Microphone uh, number three. So do you think that a open source solution, uh, do you think that an open source solution as opposed to an open standard solution um, would be able to avoid this problem or, or have you investigated in particular Coreboot if Coreboot is vulnerable to this problem. I believe Coreboot is not vulnerable to either Thunderstrike or to the Jedi Coma attacks. Uh, I have not done really any work with Coreboot, um, so I'm not sure. Although, in general... Uh, we should talk then. We, we should. In, in general, I think that uh, having open source for the, uh, for the early boot is really vital, uh, both to trust that the system is doing what we think it is. And this is one of the reasons I'm really excited about things like Bunny's uh, laptop, that where all of the source for every piece in the system is available so that we can actually understand how it all works. Okay. Um, 
So we are running a bit out of time, so please keep your questions and, uh, if possible, the answers short. Microphone number four. Yes, as you've shown, um, the firmware update not only contains a signature but also a public key. Uh, what happens if you uh, replace the public key and then just create another signature? Have you tried that? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, uh, yes, actually, the uh, I didn't go into it in the presentation. Um, I have a paper that I hope will be coming out sometime soon that actually goes into a lot more of the technical detail. The, uh, the public key in the signature is actually ignored. You can write whatever you want there, and it doesn't matter. Uh, the, <laughs> the public key is actually stored in, in, the, in the boot ROM. Um, there are actually five public keys, but only key zero is ever read. And that is the one that is actually used to, um, uh, to validate the signature. Thanks. Microphone number two. Have you looked at uh, other attack vectors than Thunderbolt that expose PCI links like express cards? I have not, but I've, uh, I've received email from someone who has looked at it and suggests that it would also be uh, vulnerable to this sort of attack. Microphone number one again. Can I launch this attack from another MacBook with a Thunderbolt cable, or do I need special hardware? That's an interesting question. Um, I have not looked into that. Whether or not, you, if you boot into like target drive mode, could you could you fake it out? Uh, possibly. Um, that might be cheaper. That uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked enough into that part of the firmware. Microphone number five. Yes. Um, you, you said that with your exploit, you can close the door behind you for this exploit. Can you provide the service to close all our MacBooks? <laughs> um, if anyone would like to borrow a, a, a Thunderbolt Ethernet adapter. Um. <laughs> uh, so right now, my, my proof of concept is, has a lot of hard-coded things for the specific version. Um, so I verified that the uh, this sort of exploit works against the other ones, but I've only actually implemented uh, the, the 10 comma one MacBook. Um, so if you have one of those, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to let you upgrade. A microphone number three. Okay, so I'm wondering, since the option ROM is only loaded during boot and you can basically, as far as I know, prevent DMA access uh, while the system is running by setting a firmware password, and you said it's possible to write the option ROM if you are in early in the boot process. Is there any way, once you've booted, to check if your Thunderbolt adapter has been infected? Uh, potentially. So from a clean system, um, you could read out the option ROM and find out if it contains the, an exploit in it. Um, but once from an infected system, if it were being sufficiently stealthy, it, it could mask that attempt to read. Um, and you had a second question uh, that I actually, I thought was, was quite good, that, um, uh, oh, regarding uh, uh, DMA. There's a lot of interesting work being done with Thunderbolt and DMA attacks, especially uh, w looking into how well does uh, VTD and the IO MMU actually protect you. And it's not clear that it provides as much protection as, as we would like. Microphone number four. Okay. Um, forgive me if this is a stupid question, but other than open sourcing the boot process entirely, which is a no-brainer, could vendors protect against this kind of attack by using um, something like timing-based attestation of the boot firmware? So knowing the timing signature that the legitimate firmware has and measuring that in the operating system or some um, another kind of electronic device that measures that, that then if an attacker uploads their own malicious firmware, they at least have to emulate the timing side channel of the legitimate firmware? So uh, to the first part of the question, I, I don't think so. The uh, MITRE presented a really neat uh, piece of malware called uh, TIC that I think was 51 bytes and was capable of beating the time, timing-based attestation. Uh, the other is that uh, it could boot the system under a virtualized uh, um, environment, or it could just rewrite the timestamp counter. That it's, you know, it, it's in ring zero. It's uh, in real mode. It can do really whatever it wants. Thank you. Thank you. Another question from number four. Um, just very, uh, two very short questions. Uh, the one was uh, to verify again, you, you said the current iMacs and Mac minis are not affected and future MacBooks will won't have this problem? That's, so 
Uh, Apple has produced a fix that they are shipping in the current Mac minis and iMac retinas um, that protects against the proof of concept. Uh, however, it leaves a, um, a huge hole uh, in terms of the option ROMs that I believe could be a Thunderstrike V2 would, would fairly easily be able to attack. And the second question was um, um, proprietary TPM modules have been uh, criticized. Um, w what do you think is, is, are they more helpful or are they in any kind, uh, do they have any drawbacks if they're not open source? So is it better to have a machine with a TPM module or without one? So uh, perhaps TPM is not, not exactly the right word, um, but some systems have sort of uh, uh, you know, co-processors or sometimes even hardware devices that will leave the main CPU and reset until they do cryptographic verification of, of the boot ROM. So that's the sort of technology uh, that I, I think is really necessary to detect these sort of attacks. Um, there's a huge number of papers about defeating TPMs and secure boot via, via other techniques. So I'm, I'm not sure how well, um, you know, a proprietary TPM versus uh, some more open source one would really be able to do. Okay, one final question from number two. So just to make sure, it's not that I can't leave my computer in the room, I can't leave any of my Thunderbolt device either, right? That's, <laughs> that's a great point. Um, yes, you should uh, keep your, your Thunderbolt devices with you along with the computer. And having said that, uh, would it theoretically be possible if you do achieve code execution from the Thunderbolt device to actually perform tests through that code? Could I create a Thunderbolt device that actually uses an option ROM to check my own EFI? Uh, you could. Unless you're running, uh, unless you've already been hit, in which case the option ROM won't be loaded at all. Okay. That uh, so all, all of my machines are are protected in this way that um, they uh, will not load option ROMs, um, which is also, you know, the sort of thing that um, uh, that would be great if it's a configuration option, just to be able to say, you know, don't do this versus. But then you'd know. If it doesn't execute, then you'd know. Oh, if it had some way to to let you know that it had executed. I suppose it depends how targeted of an attack you, you, you're expecting. Okay, so um, please give again a round of applause to Tremel.